if you have oxidative stress and inflammation that's kind of left to go awry, so it gets to the brain, gets into the cells, it can manifest itself into different types of, of issues. Can you talk a little bit about how oxidative stress and inflammation impact health and age? And what what are we, what can we do on a practical level daily to unlock our key to longevities or by addressing these two key components of aging? Well, as you've outlined, oxidative stress and inflammation drive a lot of uh, issues, you know, as we age uh, with our health outcomes. Um, and as you've ad advocated in, in your book and, and on your podcast and everything, um, diet is a foundational uh, role, exercise, uh, lifestyle modifications, uh, but supplements do play an important role in, in managing health. And uh, we've been really focused on astaxanthin. Um, as a naturally occurring supplement that can help you safely address oxidative stress and inflammation at the source. Um, because as, as you've talked about, you know, if you have oxidative stress and inflammation that's kind of left to go awry, it can manifest itself into different types of things that may downstream appear to be different types of, of issues. But if you can really focus on the root causes uh, and restore health at that um, kind of basic cellular level, uh, that, that's something that really is, is worth pursuing. Yeah, so it's really it's really sort of a, a ubiquitous process that we're constantly navigating. And it's not that all inflammation is bad or all oxidative stress is bad. It's when they get out of control, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as part of, um, you know, ongoing research and, and actually new research at the NIH, you know, uh, scientists have been looking at how do we address this through various natural or synthetic compounds. And astaxanthin is, um, is powerfully occurring a plant compound uh, that is, you know, found in algae and oceans, and essentially can have powerful effects um, in, pr in protecting us for many reasons. So, you know, we'll talk about some of the NIH research and some of their programs that they have around looking for molecules that are in, in either pharmaceutical uh, stock or in nature that actually can activate many of these uh, beneficial longevity pathways. But let's talk about astaxanthin particularly and how it helps fight some of the key hallmarks of aging, like mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, cell signaling. So talk about, and, and, and just get into the weeds a little bit about how it works on some of these uh, fundamental mechanisms that we now know underlie all aging. So we, we talked about this before in the podcast, but if you address, for example, heart disease and cancer and get rid of them from the planet, your life expectancy might increase five to seven years. If you address all the hallmarks of aging, which underlie all the chronic disease of aging, you could extend your life by 30 or 40 years, which means living to be 120. So there's a big difference. So can you talk about uh, particularly how astaxanthin targets some of these key hallmarks of aging? Yeah. So in order to do that, we can really look at what astaxanthin does um, in cell. So um, first of all, when you uh, ingest it orally, it's distributed systemically. So um, it is, is um, uh, distributed throughout your body to all your tissues and gets into the cells. In particular, uh, it gets into the cellular membranes, um, and including not just the plasma membrane, but importantly, the mitochondrial membranes, nuclear membrane. And given its structure with its polar uh, head groups and, and polyene uh, backbone, it uh, perfectly spans um, and anchors into the membranes. Um, and with that, it's, it's a great uh, you know, scavenger of reactive oxygen species, free radicals, uh, both inside and outside uh, the membranes. Um, and so as it's sitting there at that key site, say at the mitochondrial membrane, um, you know, my, mitochondria, of course, are our body's energy uh, plants. And, and as a byproduct of energy production, uh, of course, you have, you know, oxygen free radicals that are created and, and need to be addressed. And, and so astaxanthin is, is perfectly situated to sit there in the mitochondria and uh, address the excess um, reactive oxygen species that can lead to oxidative stress. And as you talked about, trigger inflammatory pathways. Um, and so looking at, say, inflammation, um, by reducing excess oxidative stress, um, you can uh, prevent the pathological activation of inflammatory pathways like NF-kappa B and its downstream cytokines like TNF-alpha, uh, COX-1, COX-2, IL-1, IL-6, prostaglandin E2, a lot of the targets of, of a lot of the anti-inflammatory drugs, but instead working upstream at the pathway activation level. Um, and, and so in terms of inflammation, you know, working upstream to prevent the pathological activation of these inflammatory pathways, we think plays a major role in, uh, you know, mitigating uh, the effects of, of inflammation. Um, and then if you transition to, say, mitochondrial function, 
Um, you know, again, being situated in the mitochondrial membrane, acetaminophen has demonstrated uh, impacts on membrane stability in the mitochondria, reductions of oxidative stress, lipid peroxidation in the mitochondria. It's been studies showing increased ATP production, say in young and geriatric dogs, for example. Uh, so it plays a fundamental role at the mitochondrial level. Um, and in addition to impacting inflammatory pathways, uh, it impacts you know, other cell signaling pathways related to aging, such as AMPK. Uh, so we've seen impacts on AMPK and, and related uh, age-related pathways. So the sirtuins, uh, FOXO3, even mTOR, target of rapamycin. So, um, so with impacts on all of these pathways, you get impacts on autophagy and mitophagy and mitogenesis and um, and all these critical, you know, uh, you know, roles that that are, are part of the aging process. That's amazing. Okay, I'm going to unpack that because that was a lot and there were a lot of acronyms in there. I don't think people necessarily know what they are. But I'm going to help you unpack <laughs> that. So I, I think the question really was how does this molecule impact some of these ancient preserved uh, longevity pathways, these receptors and mechanisms that are designed to keep us alive, to keep us alive longer, and our survival mechanisms. And and I talk a lot about them in Young Forever, these key longevity switches, things like the, the nutrient sensing pathways, mTOR, which is basically regulating autophagy by being a fasting. When you fast, you basically act, uh, inactivate mTOR, you inhibit mTOR. And that allows your cells to clean up and do self-cleaning and repair, which is autophagy, which is so important to clean up old parts and recycle things. It, you said astaxanthin also impacts uh, AMPK, which is another regulatory pathway as part of our nutrient sensing pathway that's very involved in blood sugar control and mitochondrial function in regulating inflammation, even activating sirtuin pathways. And then sirtuin pathways also you mentioned are involved um, – in the in the in the interplay between astaxanthin and aging, so uh, its sirtuins are involved in DNA repair and inhibiting inf inflammation. You mentioned things like COX two and NF kappa B. These are are compounds in the body that are regulating inflammation. So when you have high levels of NF kappa B or COX two, basically you're driving inflammation. And astaxanthin works on these mechanisms. For example, NF kappa B is involved in regulating gene transcription for all these inflammatory cytokines, some of them which you mentioned. And so we have, you know, these you know, really amazing interplay between these natural molecules and our biology to regulate these essential pathways. Uh, you mentioned FOXO, which is another really important one I want to get into, but that is involved in regulating a lot of our antioxidant pathways and our antioxidant enzymes. So basically, it's we, we, we call these compounds pleomorphic. Pleomorphic means it has many, many, many activities. For example, if you take you know, a blood pressure drug like an ACE inhibitor inhibits uh, this, you know, angiotensin converting enzyme, which regulates your blood pressure. That's it, basically. Whereas these compounds work on multiple pathways across multiple uh, receptors and multiple mechanisms that affect uh, our aging process. So it's amazing to me how, how nature and humanity have co-evolved to, to help regulate these essential biological processes without um, you know, any side effects, which is amazing because <laughs> a lot of these drugs that we use like Advil, for example, which can cause all kinds of side effects or, you know, even Celebrex, which is a COX-2 inhibitor has these side effects, but we, we don't want those side effects. We want, we want effects that are, are beneficial. And that's, what's kind of really exciting. So whether it's, you know, regulating inflammation, regulating oxidative stress, regulating autophagy, regulating mitochondrial function, regulating DNA repair. Astaxanthin works across all of these. And that's why it has broad effects across your health from your brain to your heart, to your immune system, to your eyes, across the board, it's beneficial. So I think it's kind of an amazing uh, story. I mean, and there are many molecules in nature that do this, but astaxanthin is one of the, I think, superstars. So, um, Tell us, tell us about some of the benefits. I just sort of mentioned a few of them, but tell us about some of the research uh, that's been done. This is a very, very, very well-researched compound. Uh, tell us about some of the health benefits, uh, and, and 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 we'll go through some of them. And what do they, what do they, what do they um, 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 do? And what are the highlights of how astaxanthin yeah. optimizes our health? Sure. So, like you said, a lot of other um, you know uh, agents and, and therapies are are addressing downstream and manifestations uh, of problems. And so, like you've said, it's like whack-a-mole medicine. Um, in, in the case of astaxanthin, it's working at a more fundamental level, um, really restoring cellular 
uh, function, homeostasis. And so when you're doing that, you can have this broad effect on all these things that appear to be uh, different, you know, um, uh, but in fact are, are very similar at the molecular level. And so, like you said, this, this results in a wide variety of, of uh, health uh, impacts. So we look at both, you know, like you've talked about health span and lifespan types of, of applications. Um, and so looking at lifespan, um, there's been a variety of uh, studies in model organisms um, looking at lifespan. So we've seen extension of life um, in C. elegans, the roundworm uh, models, um, also in uh, yeast and fruit flies. Um, and, and so uh, that's led to research at the um, uh, NIH-funded uh, interventions testing program looking at lifespan in, uh, in mice. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that has been demonstrated across, uh, you know, species to impact lifespan, uh, which makes sense given its impact on age related pathways and, and mechanisms, um, as we've talked about. Uh, and then in terms of health span, you know, you don't just want to live longer, right? I mean, you want to live longer and, and feel better and be healthy throughout that lifespan. So health span is really important. Um, and so things like, um, joint and muscle health, you know, the, the things that you think about as, as you age, what, what happens? You know, you're, your joints, uh, you know, you slow down physically, mentally, et cetera. So with, with joint and muscle function, uh, we've seen impacts, um, certainly on the mechanisms of joint health. So if you look at, you know, what are the top selling rheumatoid arthritis drugs treating? They're going after TNF alpha. We've seen reductions of TNF alpha. And in fact, you know, we had a head to head study versus prednisolone looking at reduction of TNF alpha and reduced that to this. Same extent as prednisolone at the same dose. So it's very potent from an anti-inflammatory perspective, targets a lot of the same uh, cytokines that, say, uh, other agents may be addressing for, say, joint issues. Um, certainly in the community of, of uh, individuals that have been taking astaxanthin, there's been um, wide reports of uh, improved uh, joint and muscle function. Uh, but certainly if you also look at, say, animal studies, um, there's been an osteoarthritis uh, model in rabbits uh, and, and saw benefits in cartilage degradation, for example. Or in the areas of like sarcopenia, you know, with muscle deterioration, obviously a major issue as people age. There's been studies in both humans and animals uh, showing benefits there. Um, so, so certainly from a physical standpoint, joint and muscle function, you've seen a lot of benefits there. Um, then you look at the leading cause of death, uh, death, cardiovascular, uh, you know, issues. Um, we, first of all, astaxanthin again gets to, uh, heart tissue and, and really helps prevent oxidative stress and, and inflammation. Which a lot of people think of, you know, heart disease as, you know, too much cholesterol. But, you know, as, as everyone now knows, it's not just about the cholesterol or the lipids. It's about the quality of, of those lipids, but it's also, say, inflammation, uh, where studies like, say, like Cantos from Novartis in, in recent, uh, in recent years showed that even if you have no impact on LDL, but all you do is reduce inflammation, you can have a major impact on major adverse cardiovascular events. And so, so we've shown benefits on both reductions of inflammation as measured by, say, HSCRP. Um, but we've also shown uh, benefits for lipids. So we've seen reductions in LDL cholesterol and importantly, oxidized LDL cholesterol. Um, and, and so, so really the quality of, of, of the, uh, the lipids, reductions of triglycerides, increases in HDL. Um, and interestingly, um, in research that, that we worked on with our collaborators, uh, we demonstrated in a mouse model that uh, you could reduce the plaque buildup um, in, in the arteries. And we, we had imaging we showed in the control versus the treated groups, the actual reduction of, of the plaque in the aortic arch, which was uh, really cool to see. Um, we also showed uh, reduction of blood clots in multiple species, species um, in both dogs and rodents. Um, and, and so both kind of thrombosis and rethrombosis uh, types of settings. So pretty profound impacts on, on cardiovascular health. Uh, blood pressure has been reduced as well. Uh, so we think that's obviously a, a huge, uh, you know, benefit for, for long-term health. Um, and then if you transition, say, to, you know, brain health, cognitive health, um, you know, the role of oxidative stress and inflammation is, is you know, um, you know, definitely demonstrated, you know, for you know, brain and, and mental health. Um, and importantly, astaxanthin actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it gets to the brain, gets into the cells, uh, and helps to, you know, reduce oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, and so... You can imagine all the benefits it could have there. You know, there'd be a, a lot of great studies that could be done in terms of, of cognitive, um, you know, health. Um, but say uh, in humans, there have been studies looking at cognitive performance and, and maze tests and things showing benefits for memory and attention and information processing. Um, and in animals, you know, there's been benefits showing, um, you know, 
uh, neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, you know, et cetera. So uh, there's been a lot of amazing research in the in the brain health space, which again makes sense given its impacts on oxidative stress inflammation at that cellular level. And uh, you can kind of go on and on. Like you said, there's a lot of research, um, and you know, you look at things like uh, skin health, eye health. Um, again, the same story: reducing oxidative stress and inflammation, you know, in, in those locations has has really important benefits. Um, and then if you say look at immune health. Um, you think about, you know, anti-inflammatories, they're, they're often, you know, if you look at what are prescribed as anti-inflammatories, they're going to have, you know, immune issues. You know, you may have, um, you know, immune suppression. Um, and, and so you're kind of, you know, battling this, I'm reducing inflammation, but now my immune system is no longer functioning in a way that actually allows me to fight off infections and, and wound heal. Um, and so with, with acesanthin, we've actually seen not only no immune suppression, but actually fewer infections, for example, in animals. Um, so we really think it's the different mechanism of attacking inflammation by kind of working at the source, allowing normal functions. So your immune system can function normally, but but not in a pathological way, uh, in a chronic, you know, long-term, low-grade inflammation, uh, you know, type of a setting, which, which is not what we want. It's quite amazing. So there's just such a vast array of research on all these various things. And the reason it works across all these problems and diseases is because it works on some of these underlying mechanisms that have to do with all disease. So what we talk about in functional medicine is the fundamental physiological systems or then biological networks or the hallmarks of aging. And so it's, it's like a, it's, it seems almost seems too good to be true, but actually when you look at the data, yeah. pretty impressive. So talk about also how, you know, where we find this in nature, you know, what, this is kind of one of the carotenoids, right? We've heard about carotenoids, the oranges and carrots, sweet potatoes, you know, beta carotene and all this stuff, right? And, um, you know, it, 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 it works as a, as a plant's defense system against environmental stresses. And, but, you know, talk to us about how it shows up in nature. Talk to us about, you know, how it plays a role in the marine food system and the chain and, and how even with salmon, why it's so important for salmon, which is, you know, when we see the orange color, why, why it's so important for them as opposed to other fish, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the whole story of carotenoids and acesanthin is really interesting. Um, Carotenoids actually co-evolved with photosynthesis, you know, so they're a key component of photosynthesis and help to uh, protect plants from uh, photooxidative damage. Um, so it played a fundamental role um, in, in evolution there. Um, and in the marine environment, acesanthin is produced by microalgae, um, like you said, as a defense mechanism against UV light from the sun. Um, and so these are green algae that um, when stressed by the sunlight, produce astaxanthin as a defense mechanism and then turn bright red. Um, and, and so it, it plays this vital role in dealing with severe environmental stress. Um, and then microalgae are then consumed up the, up the food chain. Um, so into crustaceans, krill, uh, crab, lobsters, shrimp, you know, up through salmon, other fish, whales, obviously a huge part of their diet is krill. Um, so it's, it's been this uh, really important nutrient throughout the marine environment. And to take one example with salmon, uh, salmon, of course, are not just swimming around in the ocean. They also, you know, migrate, they, they uh, swim upstream to reproduce. Um, and it's amazing feats of, of endurance and, and strength uh, to do that. Um, but the way they are able to do that is because of astaxanthin. They are loaded up on astaxanthin, you know, in, in their flesh. And that really helps them deal with the consequences of that upstream journey. Um, and so without astaxanthin, salmon would not only be gray instead of the beautiful pink color, you know, that we all yeah. know, but they would be smaller, they'd be weaker, they're prone to infections, but they wouldn't be able to swim upstream. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing uh, role that astaxanthin plays in nature. Um, and so like you said, we've all consumed it, um, you know, through uh, salmon or uh, crustaceans, uh, shrimp, etc. cetera. Um, but, but certainly it's hard to get a high enough level on a consistent basis. Um, and so, you know, just like the salmon, we, we would like to benefit in, in the same way. And, and certainly nature has come up with something that um, has really worked to, in, to have really important, um, you know, protections against env environmental stresses. And with carotenoids, um, if you look at the evolution, um, they, they kind of went through a series of steps and ultimately, you know, went through different carotenoids. Like you said, beta carotene is an example of, of a commonly known uh, carotenoid. Um, but, but astaxanthin is a particular type of carotenoid called a xanthophyll carotenoid, um, that was later in the evolutionary process, you know, that was kind of optimized in the apex or king of the carotenoids. Um, and importantly, um, it has, uh, oxygenated, uh, head groups. So it has a hydroxyl group on each, uh, end 
of the molecule and a ketone group. And that gives the molecule polarity so that when it spans the membrane, and we've actually done studies with our collaborator at Harvard showing that astaxanthin spans the membrane and doesn't disrupt the membrane. If you, and in the same study, we looked at, say, beta carotene, which can also get into the membrane, but is, is not, uh, polarized, uh, doesn't have the hydroxyl groups, for example. Um, and then it just sits and kind of, uh, perturbs or disturbs uh, the membrane. Um, and, and so not every antioxidant is the same. Not every carotenoid, uh, is the same. And so we think nature came up with astaxanthin as kind of the optimal uh, carotenoid and it's certainly been demonstrated throughout the natural environment and, and certainly with, with humans in, in the last 20 years. That's amazing. And, and how, how is it different than other antioxidants? You're talking about vitamin C or vitamin E or other ones. So, so how does it yeah. compare? So there's a few different things. Um, one, you can look at, uh, it's antioxidant, uh, you know, capacity or performance. You can look at things like singlet oxygen quenching. And, and in those types of studies, we've seen that it's 6,000 times stronger than vitamin C or 550 times stronger than vitamin E or, you know, 40 times stronger than beta carotene. And so you can have a, a performance, uh, you know, benefit in terms of a scavenging, you know, free radicals, for example. Um, but as in real estate, you know, location, 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 that really matters. And so the fact that astaxanthin gets to your cells, but actually gets into the membrane of the cells. And like I just said, the fact that it spans and stabilizes the membranes, distinguishes it from other uh, antioxidants, and that it gets to not only the, say, the plasma or outer membrane of the cell, but gets to the mitochondrial membranes. Um, and so getting to those privileged uh, locations uh, is something that not every antioxidant does. So you want to get to the cells, you want to get to the mitochondria, you want to get into the membranes, not disturb the membranes, and sit there and protect the membranes from oxidative stress. Uh, and so that's something that really sets acetanthin apart from other antioxidants. Mm. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about now the FOXO gene, FOXO3, which is a really important gene. So maybe you can explain what it is, what its role is in the body, and, and how it plays a role in longevity, and what acetanthin does to FOXO3 pathways. Yeah, so the FOXO3 gene is really interesting, and, and our, our collaborators uh, here in Hawaii uh, helped to actually uncover the link between FOXO3 and human longevity. Um, you may be familiar with the Honolulu Heart Program, um, yeah. which was yeah. uh, you know started in the 1960s with 8,000 Japanese-American men. And this amazing program followed these, uh, these men for decades um, with you know, doctor's visits and blood tests. Um, and, and looked at all the reasons, you know, that their health declined or why they died. And, um, and it created this amazing, um, you know, database and, of, of, you know, uh, doctor's visits, uh, records, but also, you know, biological specimens. Um, and so our, our team in, in Hawaii here looked at that and, and, and discovered that, um, uh, FOXO3, uh, was, uh, something that when assayed, uh, in these individuals, um, was associated with, uh, those that lived um, the longest and, and the healthiest. Um, and so uh, if you have the right version of the FOXO3 gene, uh, which would be the GG allele, um, that you would actually have the best chances of living to 100 healthy. Um, wow. And if you don't have that version, you know, if you have the, the TT or the GT, um, you know, uh, versions, then um, you are you're less likely to live that long healthy. Um, and, and so, and the difference between those different uh, versions of, of the FOXO3 gene is is how active they are. Um, and with astaxanthin, uh, with the same group in Hawaii, um, we did a, a study in mice and we showed that astaxanthin uh, actually uh, increased activation of the FOXO3 gene um, a, as measured by the uh, mRNA expression and, and uh, our mRNA levels. And, and so, this was actually in the heart tissue of the mice. And so we, we demonstrated that you could increase FOXO3 activation in the heart tissue of the mice. Um, and so this was uh, really amazing. And it also confirmed that in the roundworms and the C. elegans, where we saw life extension results, if you knocked out the roundworms version of the FOXO3 gene, the ortholog DAF16, um, the lifespan benefit went away. Um, and, and so it looks like in the roundworms that the mechanism of uh, extending life was via their version of FOXO3. Um, we know in humans that FOXO3 is associated uh, as one of the key anti-aging genes associated with longevity, and we demonstrated in mice that we have activated FOXO3. Um, this was really amazing research and actually led to uh, the National Institutes of Health or National Institute on Aging. Um, they have a program that they fund called the Interventions Testing Program, um, and they actually selected astaxanthin 
uh, to be included in this program to look at lifespan in mice. You know, prior to this, lifespan was just like I said, examined in model organisms, uh, but not yet in mammals. Um, and, and so the, the ITP, as it's called, the Interventions Testing Program, an NIA funded program, um, has been um, uh, running for the last 20 or so years. Every year, they take a cohort of a few promising longevity agents. Um, and there's a lot of uh, well-known agents that have been tested in, in this program. Uh, rapamycin is probably uh, the, the agent that has been tested uh, the most and demonstrated efficacy uh, you know, in multiple cohorts. Uh, but obviously, rapamycin has, has side effects and has prompted people to look yeah. at different types of dosing and rapalogs or analogs of rapamycin. Um, but even things like resveratrol, um, there was a lot of hype around resveratrol in 2006, 2007. It was, mm-hmm. it was included in the cohort back then. It actually did not extend lifespan uh, in, in this model. Metformin has been tested. Um, it also did not show benefit. Um, the NAD precursor NR was, was tested, did not show benefit. Um, there's only been a handful of agents that have shown benefit in this model. And interestingly, it's, it's highly, highly rigorous. It's conducted at three different sites. The University of Michigan, the Jackson Lab, and the University of Texas Health Sciences. Um, and so they, they have specially bred mice that are, um, you know, designed to not have confounding variables that you might find in typical laboratory uh, in, in, in bred mice. Um, and so they have uh, specially bred mice. They run it at three different sites in parallel, literally thousands of mice, you know, in each cohort. Um, and, um, and so we were fortunate to be selected, uh, to, to supply the astaxanthin to this study. Um, and, and this is uh, the NIH study. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an NIH funded study. Uh, it's called the interventions testing program. Um, and, uh, the study for our cohort started back in 2019 and actually just wrapped up this year. Um, and we've been working with the, the ITP team, uh, to get the manuscript drafted. It's in the process of being submitted for publication. Um, and we're going to be really excited to be. Uh, talking about those results uh, as soon as they come out, you know, it, hopefully in the next uh, few months. Um, and, and so, uh, the thing that, you know, we think is really important when looking at this is, you know, first of all, can you demonstrate efficacy in a model like this? Um, but what is the practical application of this? Something like, like I said, like rapamycin, which has demonstrated lifespan benefits in this model, doesn't really have the utility in humans that we would like because of its, you know, limitations on safety and tolerability. Whereas with the case yeah. of, of astaxanthin, because of its mechanism and because of just all, all the data that we've um, demonstrated, it, it's extre- except, exceptionally safe. Um, and, and so both because we've consumed it in our diet, we've had decades of experience as a dietary supplement. Um, but it turns out that astaxanthin w- is actually a major component of the animal feed. Uh, so farm-raised salmon, you know, uh, despite, you know, having... Uh, poor living conditions and other things, they're actually fed astaxanthin to make them pink, just like they would get it right. in the wild. Right. So it's, it's a really right. important uh, nutrient in their, um, in their feed, but also uh, uh, other, you know, animal feed utilizes astaxanthin. And in order for the FDA to allow astaxanthin to be used as um, an additive uh, for animal feed, there was a very extensive state, uh, set of sa- uh, safety studies that were done, the likes of which would be done for pharmaceutical development, you know, so long-term toxicity studies, carcinogenicity studies, you know, et cetera, uh, and showed at very high levels and very long durations, literally um, thousands of milligrams per kil- kilogram of body weight. So compared to what human dosing is, which is, you know, fractions of a milligram per kilogram, um, you know, uh, or, you know, a couple of milligrams per kilogram, depending on how uh, how you want to dose, um, it, it's orders of magnitude, uh, you know, difference between these animal studies and human studies. And we showed, uh, or a study, you know, third parties showed that there were no side effects of clinical significance in any of those studies. And so that's something that when we look that's at impressive. longevity applications, you want to have something you can take every day for the rest of your life that, that's safe. Um, and that's what we think really sets astaxanthin apart. That's impressive. And, and, and it, you know, just to sort of clarify for people, the NIH will sort of is looking for screening molecules that may have potential for longevity, and it doesn't test very many, and it's just at a few... And, and so this is a big deal to get astaxanthin tested in this way and to look at its effect on longevity and, and many of the longevity pathways. So very excited to see that study and the latest science around that. I mean, and there's so much more data. I mean, in 1998, there were 200 papers. Now there's over 3,000 papers on astaxanthin. Um, are there any other interesting sort of new data that's coming out that you want to share with us? I mean, it's just like you said, it's been an explosion of research. Um, and so when we started with this back in the late 90s, there was less than 200 peer-reviewed papers. Um, you know, 15 years later, it was up to 1,000 peer-reviewed papers. 10 years further on now to present day, it's, it's more than 3,000 papers. 
Uh, and I think we'll see over the next few years just a further explosion in, in the research uh, with acetaminophen. And so um, it's been well studied and well known in the scientific community uh, um, and starting to get more and more traction, but it really has not been known in the in the general uh, you know public uh, setting. Um, and, and so the research is something because it's a it's a naturally occurring molecule. Unlike a, a proprietary pharmaceutical, research can be conducted, you know, throughout the world by various academic institutions and, 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 and others uh, in the private sector. Um, and, and so what we've seen in recent years is just um, further research looking at elucidating the mechanisms uh, of action. So say, uh, you know, we've seen impacts like we talked about on AMPK and, and other, you know, age-related pathways, um, but things like, well, you know, does astaxanthin impact autophagy? And you can find papers on autophagy. Um, and, and so really further elucidating the, the ways it works, because we know that it works, you know, through, um, through nature, through evolution, and, and through the studies that have been done in, in humans and animals. But further understanding how it works is something that a lot of research, um, you know, is, uh, is uh, taking place at this time. And um, also further, you know, clinical studies. There's been more than 50 or 60 human clinical studies. And these are smaller uh, pilot types of studies, um, and, but you know, areas of cardiovascular health, uh, you know, metabolic, liver health. And, and so I think continuing to expand in those areas is, is uh, what's really exciting and what we'll continue to see in the, in the coming years. That's amazing. Um, so w in terms of the, the sort of next steps for astaxanthin as a sort of a molecule of interest in longevity, um, you know, where do you see this going? Well, I see a couple of things. Um, I, I do think that um, I think astaxanthin will become part of the dialogue around longevity. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk around various other agents that have a lot of promise, you know, NAD precursors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, we think astaxanthin should be right there in that conversation and at the forefront of it because it has these profound uh, impacts on, on aging, uh, health span, lifespan. It's super safe. It's commercially available. You know, so it's accessible. You know, so this is something that, you know, if you can imagine, snap your fingers, everyone taking astaxanthin, you would have a much healthier society. Um, and yeah. so this is something that why wouldn't you do it? You know, if it's safe, it reduces oxidative stress and inflammation at this, you know, core cellular level. Um, it, it's something that we frankly believe everyone, you know, should be taking. Um, and, and so we think that that's, um, going to be the next steps is really, um, you know, making astaxanthin a household name and something that is associated with, with longevity. Um, and, and so that's really the next steps is, is building this uh, public dialogue, this community around astaxanthin um, and, and healthy aging. Um, and then on, on the flip side, there's also uh, pharmaceutical applications. Um, and, and, you know, you could look at, for instance, higher doses for uh, disease states, you know, which, which hopefully, you know, through diet, exercise, lifestyle, supplementation with, uh, with compounds such as astaxanthin, you know, you, you're healthy. But, you know, um, the reality is, you know, people you know, will develop issues. Um, uh, and, and so if you can have agents like astaxanthin that are, um, you know, put through the FDA uh, clinical trial process and approved as a pharmaceutical for certain disease applications, analogous to say the omega-3s or the fish oils where you have prescription versions and you have supplement versions. And, and we could we could see that as well. And we have uh, a, a pharmaceutical version of the molecule that we've developed um, and, and would look to advance in future years as well. Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, when you think about, okay, this would be great, it's going to be a great molecule, it's, you know, maybe going to be good for a billion people, right? <laughs> and it affects, you know, joint pain and muscle function and cognitive health and heart health and lifespan and many, many things. So uh, the problem is supply, right? So if you're looking at where it comes from, it comes from algae in the ocean and and doesn't seem like a really sustainable way to get that much astaxanthin. So can you talk about the difference between the synthetic versions, the kind that are synthesized in the lab versus the natural astaxanthin and, and how they're different and why maybe even the synthetic might be better? Because typically people think, oh, synthetic, that's not good. I want the natural form. Can you kind of explain that a little bit? Sure. So we've actually worked uh, with both forms. Um, and, and so my father and I, who you know, I've worked with for the last 25 years here with astaxanthin, um, both started with a company that was producing microalgae. Um, and so it was, it was on the big island of Hawaii. It was literally in the lava fields. Um, so you, you dig out ponds in the, in the lava fields and, and grow microalgae, uh, which it's a great environment for growing the microalgae and stressing them with the sunlight to produce astaxanthin. Um, but like you said, it, it's a very difficult process to scale. Um, it takes a lot of land. 
Um, but also it's, it's not the most pure. Um, you know, you have contamination issues in the case of that location. You're next to the volcano. So you could have bog. You're next to the airport. Uh, so you could have, you know, jet uh, vapor, you know, from the fuel. You can have uh, just other, you know, elements uh, externally. It's, it's essentially farming. Um, and so you're going to have potential com- contamination. Um, it also takes a lot of energy, a lot of water. Uh, so in terms of impact on the environment, um, you know, it's something that uh, is, is not optimal. Um, and so we thought that, like you said, if you want to bring this, you know, to, to the world, to the mass market, you need something that's scalable, that's sustainable, that's pure, that's consistent. Um, and so we transitioned to, um, natural product total synthesis. Um, and so that is where you are in the laboratory, uh, you know, taking chemical building blocks and constructing the molecule step by step and arriving at, uh, the exact molecule you find in nature. Um, and, but without, uh, any other components with, with the microalgal form, um, you not only have to grow the microalgae in the first place, but then you have to extract uh, the astaxanthin from the microalgae and you can't get just the astaxanthin out. You're going to have maybe five or 10% astaxanthin and the rest is other microalgal matter. Um, you know, which is probably, it doesn't hurt you, but it's, you don't need that. You know, that's not the active ingredient. Uh, and actually gives it kind of a fishy smell and aftertaste, which is not the astaxanthin. It's the other content from the algae. And so with the synthetic form, we have something where it is just the naturally occurring molecule, the exact same chemical formula, exact same chemical structure. So it, whether the algae synthesize it internally or we synthesize it in the lab, you're arriving at the same place. But in our case, we're doing it now with, with very high purity, very high consistency, um, you know, and something that uh, in studies has been shown to actually be much more environmentally sustainable because it uses less land, less water, less energy. Um, and, and so we think that is a, a huge, huge, you know, uh, benefit for the uh, synthetic form. Um, and like you said, there's been some, you know, obviously there, there are some negative views on, you know, synthetic uh, types of products. But in this case, uh, we believe you have the best of both worlds. You know, synthesis is what's used to produce most of your small molecule drugs. Um, and, you know, the manufacturing rigor of drugs is not what's in question. It's how they act biologically and their side effects. And so if you, if you can produce a naturally occurring molecule, make a nature identical form, you have the pharmaceutical like manufacturing, you know, purity and control, but you have the benefits of this natural product. Um, and, and so th- those are, you know, some of the key benefits. And the final benefit is we have a special formulation of the synthetic astaxanthin, which if you don't formulate it, or uh, esterify in the case of the pharmaceutical form, um, it's not bioavailable. Um, and so we, we specially formulate uh, the, the astaxanthin and we actually conducted a head-to-head study versus a leading microalgal astaxanthin product on the market. It was a human study crossover design and we gave a group of human volunteers the microalgal astaxanthin uh, product and then measured their blood levels over the course of 24 hours. Um, had them washed out for an entire week without any astaxanthin supplements or, or food, uh, and then um, provided them with the synthetic form with our special formulation um, and demonstrated uh, over the course of that same 24-hour period, both uh, a maximum concentration or C-max, as well as the total concentration, the, the total area under the curve over the full 24 hours of three times the blood levels of astaxanthin. Uh, so there's, there's a very significant bioavailability difference. Um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you, you swallow a capsule, you think it all goes in your body, but it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, some can pass right through you, which is, which is a shame. And so in this case, having the, you know, superior, you know, three times bioavailability, uh, you know, is kind of the, the third key component in addition to the environmental sustainability and the increased purity. So there's benefits to the synthetic version. That's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yes, great. Yes, now, exactly. um, there's a lot of astaxanthin on the market. How is this one different? Yeah. So almost every astaxanthin product on the market um, is comes from microalgae um, or you know some downstream uh, version, say like krill, you know, which which cons- you know ultimately consume uh, astaxanthin, you know, in, in nature, right, you know, derived from microalgae, um, and, and so. The, the issues with these products are, are what I've described in terms of, you know, uh, the supply to, to scale and, and, and you know, serve the world is, is uh, challenging. Uh, the purity, the consistency, the bioavailability, those are all the, the challenges uh, with, the, with these products. Um, you know, whereas our form, like we talked about, is, is the synthetic nature identical form. Um, and, and we believe it's something that, uh, you know, healthcare professionals like, like yourself would understand the benefits of the rigor, um, of, of delivering this, this naturally occurring product, but with the synthetic production. Um, and, and so that's really the, the key difference that, that sets us apart. And, 
Um, we, we also believe that, um, you know, no one has really created a conversation around astaxanthin. And, and so that's something that we're looking to do, um, here is, is actually, um, you know, communicate the benefits of, of astaxanthin, you know, to the world. And, and, and one important note I'd like to make is that, you know, there's a lot of research out there with, with both synthetic and natural forms uh, of, of the product. Um, you know, the safety studies I referenced, the very high dose long term studies, those were with the synthetic form. A lot of the animal studies, a lot of the in vitro studies are, are done with the synthetic form. The human studies, uh, most of them have been done um, with the microalgal forms because those have been the forms that have been on the market uh, longer. Um, but in recent years, you know, um, we, for example, have done clinical studies showing benefits in the cardiovascular, real world cardiovascular patient population that was on all the cardiovascular meds. Um, you know, but we still showed benefits on top of that in terms of reductions of, you know, lipids and oxidized LDL, uh, blood pressure, et cetera. So there's been, there will be more studies going forward with, with the synthetic form, but there's been a lot of research with both synthetic and natural and biologically astaxanthin is astaxanthin. And, and so you can look at the literature and, and the benefits of astaxanthin, you know, are applicable to both synthetic and natural, but the real difference is how you make it, how you deliver it. Uh, and, and so that's really where we distinguish ourselves. That's amazing. Well, I, I mean, this is just such a great conversation. I think, you know, it's important for everybody to understand that, you know, living healthy and long requires the foundations, which is healthy eating, exercise, sleep, stress management, the right basic foundational social fabric that you're embedded in that keeps you healthy and connected and alive. And then supplements take a role. So I just want people to understand that they're part of, they're called supplements, not replacements. <laughs> but I think this is a very promising molecule. And I'm very excited to hear about the research on this, David. And particularly, I want to see the data from the NIH trial, because I think that's going to be a very compelling uh, story. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. And by neutralizing those free radicals, then by definition, nitric oxide is anti-inflammatory. Actually, we can say that NO is antioxidant. You know, in many cases, believe me, after all the years of research,